morning, and welcome to our study of the book of Acts in the New Testament. We'll be focusing our thoughts on Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 36 in this particular lesson. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been working our way through Peter's sermon on the first Pentecost following the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus in Acts chapter 2. In verses 14 through 21, Luke explains, or Peter rather, explains the phenomena associated with the baptism of the Spirit that had caught the attention of the festival crowd. It wasn't due to drunkenness, as some in the crowd had speculated, but it was in fulfillment of what God spoke hundreds of years earlier through the prophet Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. See, God had long planned to do what was playing out before their very eyes there on that Pentecost. The last days of the old covenant age had arrived. Starting in verse 22 of Acts 2, Peter transitions to the main point of his lesson, Jesus of Nazareth. He was the focal point of God's last day's work. Peter called their attention to how God had attested to his son by empowering him to do the miraculous things that he did. That, of course, as Peter says, was a fact they couldn't deny. He affirmed that it was God's plan to deliver his son over for sacrifice but that it was his own people who were guilty of carrying out the death sentence. But that was not the end of the story, thankfully. God raised up his son from death. The death of Christ at the hand of godless men did not derail the predetermined plan of God. Far from it. Why? Because God has resurrection power. He can raise the dead. Once again, Peter uses Old Covenant scriptures to prove his point. We'll begin to pick up here in Acts chapter 2, verse 25, as, as Peter goes on to prove what he just uh, led up to. <clears throat> Acts 2.25 says, For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Here Peter uses Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, to make his case. The text is a psalm of confidence that the apostle uses to support the resurrection. The psalm opens with a statement of confidence. The psalmist, whom David, or Peter rather, identifies here as David, sees the Lord before him always. And God's presence at the psalmist's right hand means that he will not be shaken. Peter uses the psalm because the kind of defense God gave to the psalmist is like that which Jesus received. God's protection and the certainty of it are key to the citation's tone and use. The hymn at the start of the verse is Christ. And of course, it says in the start of verse 25, for David says of him, you back up in verses 22 through 24, and uh, Peter had been talking about Christ. So he's the subject here. Verse 26 reads, therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Now, the confidence in the presence of God in verse 25 naturally leads to the positive emotions of the psalmist mentioned here in verse 26. And again, Peter quoting here from Psalm 16. Uh, emotions like gladness, exaltation, and hopefulness. I'm reminded as I read these verses, based again, you know, the praise for God based upon God's presence and the confidence he gives. I'm reminded of what David also wrote in Psalm 23, verse 4. As part of the Psalm of the Good Shepherd, he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So David there, of course, affirms the fact that he was able to go through difficult times in life because God was there. The mention of hope here in verse 26 is inextricably tied to the resurrection in the scriptures. It was the hope of Israel. We'll see that in just a few moments. Ultimately, though, Israel misunderstood the nature of the promised resurrection. We see resurrection language used all the way back in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 11 through 14. That's the famous chapter on the valley of dry bones, and the point there is that God can raise the dead. But Ezekiel 37, starting in verse 11, we'll read through verse 14, says this. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So here Ezekiel's point is being made about the, the story. 
Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. There's our word. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have done, have spoken rather, and done it, declares the Lord. So again, resurrection talk, resurrection promise for Israel. I see it hinted at in what <clears throat> happens between Jesus and Martha after the death of Lazarus in John 11, verses 23 through 26. Jesus has come to Bethany, uh, ultimately to raise Lazarus from the dead, but uh, you know Mary and Martha don't know that yet, and they're grieving. It says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So you see there, Mary had been brought up like all Jews with this resurrection hope. And she's appealing to it there. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will die, will live rather, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So there Jesus talks about the resurrection hope of Israel. We see it later in the book of Acts as well, this hope of Israel that I'm tying here to the resurrection. In Acts 23, verse 6, Paul has been defending himself before the Jewish leadership, but things are starting to deteriorate. And it says, but perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, saying, brethren... I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. So once again, hope and resurrection tied together. And Paul uses the difference in the, the ideas about the resurrection between the Pharisees and Sadducees to, to help him out in that situation. Acts 24, verses 14 and 15, again, Paul says, But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of my fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves cherish, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So once again, pointing to the hope within old covenant Israel of this resurrection that God promised, a resurrection, as it says here, of the righteous and the wicked. Then later in Acts 26, verses 6 through 8, Paul says, now I'm standing for now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O king, I am being accused by the Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So once again, when we have hope and resurrection tied together, in reality, it is it was the hope of Israel. It's stated even more directly in Acts 28, verse 20, right near the end of the book of Acts. Paul has made his way to Rome. He's called the Jewish leaders there together to talk to them. And he says, for this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and speak to you, for I'm wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. It was Paul's resurrection teaching that got him in trouble. And, of course, it's contrasted with what had come to be the belief about resurrection among uh, the Jews of his day, and uh, but it didn't keep it from being the hope that they all were expecting. Again, they expected it, but their uh, ideas about what it consisted of were, were different. Acts 20, Acts 2, rather, verse 27. Again, going on with a quote from Act, uh, Psalm 16, Peter says, Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. This verse here, is the key to the quote, as it appears again a second time in verse 31, where Peter explains his understanding of the psalm. The fundamental assertion here is that the one referred to in the psalm has confidence that God will not abandon his soul to Hades. Hades, of course, in scripture is the Greek equivalent of Sheol, or the grave, the place where the dead are gathered to await judgment. Being in Hades stands in contrast here to being 
in God's presence and expresses the threat that death represents. Of course, throughout the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, we have reference here to Hades. In Matthew 11, verse 23, Jesus says, And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For the miracles that occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. And as Jesus talks with Peter in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 18 of Matthew 16, it says, Jesus says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it or prevail against it. You see, part of what Jesus came to do was to overcome death in Hades. And Jesus is saying here, by virtue of what I'm doing, uh, you know, the Hades won't be able to keep the dead. And as we'll see in just a moment, we'll talk more about that. In Luke 16, verses 22 and 23, of course, we've got the, the parable of the rich man and, and Lazarus. And uh, it speaks there in verses 22 and 23 of Luke 16. Now, the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Then finally, a couple of places in Revelation. Part of the last day's work of Jesus there in the first century was to overcome the Hadean realm. In Revelation 1, the very first chapter, verses 17 and 18, John says, When I saw him, speaking of the resurrected Christ, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Well, what's Jesus going to do with the keys of death and Hades? He's going to unlock that the realm of the dead. Revelation 20, right near the end, verses 13 and 14. In the aftermath of the conquering Christ, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And why did they do that? Because uh, Hades can't prevail or overcome what Jesus was doing. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So the non-abandonment to Hades, spoken here in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, the declaration that this one will not see corruption, and the idea of the person being secure, including in his flesh, lead Peter here in Acts 2 to argue that resurrection even an immediate bodily resurrection in the case of Christ is affirmed here. We'll get to Acts 2, verses 30 and 31 in just a little bit. But once again, Paul is going to quote Peter, rather, there is going to quote from, from uh, Psalm 16. All right, verse 28 of Acts 2. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Once again, this final part of the quote from Psalm 16, this final verse of the quote contains a note of triumph, doesn't it? It expresses trust and confidence in God's deliverance and abiding presence. It was the presence of God who elicited the emotions of, of security. And now, of course, it speaks here of, of uh, trust and more confidence. Again, all this language, Peter argues, fits resurrection. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. In Psalm 25, verse 4, the psalmist says, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Of course, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, during his own ministry, Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, verse 29 of Acts 2, Peter here based upon his quote from the Old Testament in Psalm 16, now gets to the interpretation. It says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So once again, Peter is quoted from the psalm, attribute, attribute, attributes it to David, but as we'll see as he goes on, ultimately the psalm wasn't speaking of David himself. Now Peter gets to his interpretation and application of this psalm to Jesus. 
The explanation of how to read the psalm runs here in Acts 2 through verse 31, and then verses 32 and 33 show how the psalm relates to the recent events they had just witnessed. The passage here teaches that God's plan included the resurrection and serves to explain its significance for pointing to Jesus as the Messiah or the Christ. The passage also represents a second proof of fulfillment for the resurrection beyond the eyewitnesses. Peter makes the point here that the text is not only about the patriarch David, which is probably the prevalent view, given the fact that he addresses the point so directly. This is the only text in the New Testament that calls David a patriarch. And of course, it's used here in the sense of the head of a family, because it's going to be a, this, this uh, descendant of David that it's ultimately speaking of. Peter here argues that it's possible to say with confidence that the psalm is ultimately not about David. David is, according to, as Peter says here, David is both dead and buried and his tomb is still among us. The tomb shows that David cannot fulfill in the fullest sense the psalm's point about the confidence of God's divine protection, for one can observe David's undisturbed grave, which testifies to David still being in the realm of the dead or, or Hades. To realize fully the expression of confidence, the psalm expresses about God's continual presence one the one referred to must be raised and this cannot be about a still buried david whose grave is undisturbed verse 30 of acts 2 says and so again peter making his application here and so because he or david was a prophet and knew that god had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne so the inspired apostle here refers to King David as a prophet of God. David filled a lot of roles, but here we learn he was also a prophet. In Act, back in chapter 1 of, of Acts, in verse 16, there Peter says, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And then, of course, in verse or Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 23, verses 1 and 2, notice what it says. Right near the end of David's earthly life, he says, Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, declares, The man who was raised on high declares, The anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. So even David had a sense that God was using him to speak of things perhaps even beyond his day. Now, it's likely here, of course, that David didn't know the full extent of his prophetic words in Psalm 16. As he wrote the words of Psalm 16, he was thinking about his own situation in life, right? God's own presence and protection for him in the struggles that he faced. We know, of course, that the words have a deeper significance only because an inspired person reveals that fact. Peter tells us that it has a, a greater fulfillment in Jesus. It's much like what Peter writes in his first letter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 reads, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries seeking to know what time or person the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So there's this sense that the prophets, again, of old, speaking in their day, were speaking of something they didn't fully understand, and yet ultimately come into uh, fruition much, much later. What David did know, of course, was that God had promised that one of his descendants would rule over the people of God. That's what verse 30 of Acts 2 says. We find that in Psalm 132, verse 11, the Lord had sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I will set up your throne. And then, of course, 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, God himself tells David, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne 
the throne of his kingdom forever. And of course, likely the immediate fulfillment of that was in Solomon, who did build the house of God. But in a greater sense, it's looking ahead to the ultimate son of David, who was Jesus, the Messiah. Peter's point here is that the work of this coming son of David is on display now in the Spirit's present distribution, as verses 32 through 36 are going to declare in just a moment. Every other Old Testament text cited in this chapter is already initially fulfilled by what Jesus has done. The allusion to this psalm operates in the same way. In verse 31, again on the heels of verse 30, where it speaks of David, knowing that God has sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Verse 31 says, he, or David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, or Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. So the inspired apostle interprets David's prophetic words as referring specifically to the resurrection of Christ. If the psalm was ever to be connected to David, it must surely be connected even more to the Messiah, whom God has shown Jesus to be by his resurrection from the dead. In addition to the verb tenses for see and abandon in this, in verse, or verse 31 here, uh, they are now aorist instead of future, underscoring the verse's current fulfillment in that particular day and time. Verse 32 says, this Jesus, Peter says, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. So from the preceding discussion of scripture, resurrection and the Christ, Peter turns to Jesus and his resurrection. Peter puts the two together and declares God's work of fulfilling that promise. Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah, the one, and it's affirmed by the resurrection. Peter preaches the very Jesus who has been crucified, the Jesus many think is dead and perhaps to be forgotten, is the Christ. The apostles are taking the call of Jesus to be his witnesses very seriously. Remember back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said after he was risen from the dead, you shall be my witnesses. Well, Peter here in Pentecost in Acts 2 and the others are taking that seriously. They're testifying to the risen Jesus. The resurrection is not a symbol or a metaphor for anything. It was a real event that changed the direction of the witnesses' lives. Its reality points to God's work and vindication, the significance of which follows in verses 33 through 36. You see, there's kind of a syllogism here in Peter's reasoning. We could put it this way. Point number one, the Messiah will rise from the dead as the scripture shows. Peter has affirmed that. He's shown from the Old Testament scriptures. The Messiah will rise from the dead. Point number two, but God raised Jesus. Therefore, verse, or point three, Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 33 says, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So according to Peter, what happened as a result of the resurrection? The verse here begins with, therefore, to make the application. Peter makes three points here, the first two of which set up the third. Here's point number one. Jesus was exalted to or by the right hand of God. The language that alludes to Psalm 110, verse 1, and sets up the citation of the psalm in verses 34 and 35. While the death and resurrection of Christ are certainly important, in God's salvation efforts, it's also true that the ascension or exaltation of Christ is vital as well. And uh, I want to emphasize that fact. Yes, we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the core elements of the gospel, but the ascension is vital to that as well. The apostles went on to preach this in Acts chapter 5, verses 30 through 32. It says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. This is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And throughout the rest of the New Testament, the writers by inspiration talk often about this ascension this exaltation to the right hand of God, places like Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 23, Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 4, and 1 Peter 3, verse 20 
2. So once again, point 1 here of, of Acts 2, verse 33, Jesus has been exalted to the right hand of God. Point 2 from this verse is that he received from the Father the promise of the Spirit. We've talked much in the opening lessons here in chapters 1 and 2 of Acts about God promising the Spirit, part of that hope of Israel. In Luke 24, verse 49, the resurrected Lord said, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. It's rehearsed again in Acts 1, verse 4. So, again, that's what's happened here on this Pentecost, this pouring forth of the Spirit, and Peter is tying that to Jesus and his work as Messiah. Point number three, as a result of the ascension and exaltation of Jesus and the pouring out of the Spirit, uh, Jesus, of course, has it says here, Jesus has poured out what the audience sees and hears, that is the gift of the Spirit. Spirit. Jesus has fulfilled what Joel prophesied, Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. As important as the resurrection is to show that Jesus is alive and vindicated, it is even more significant as an indication of where Jesus went. And that's, of course, to the right hand of God, to God's presence, and what he does from there. For direct reference, the giving of the gift of the Spirit. The outpouring, of course, is now what the crowd is witnessing. It's what spawned this preaching on Pentecost. The promise realized is what they see and hear. Jesus' resurrection and ascension has led to all of this activity involving the Spirit on this particular Pentecost. Verse 34 of Acts 2, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, I, the Lord, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter here now turns to his third full Old Testament citation. This is Psalm 110, verse 1, and it's an important proof text throughout the rest of the New Testament. Like the point made early about David being buried, this detail says that David cannot be the ultimate referent for the Psalm's language. The vindication of Jesus is about more than that he lives and others will be raised. It explains who Jesus is and how God showed him to be the Lord and Christ. Here the title Lord has its full heavenly authority because of Jesus' position. Here's the, the uh, turning point in Paul's lesson. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, in context here, Jesus of Nazareth, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter draws the combined scriptural arguments in his sermon to a conclusion. The conclusion is that the one you have crucified, verse 23, is the one whom God has made Lord and Christ. And what a bomb to drop here to this Pentecost crowd. Peter has just proven beyond a shadow of a doubt from the scriptures to these people who valued them that they had just crucified the Messiah they'd been waiting so long for. The very one the Jewish leaders crucified is the unique anointed one of whom God has placed at his side. The point is made here to establish their guilt and to lay the groundwork for their need to repent. And of course, that's where we'll stop for the day. And it's starting there in verse 37. In our next lesson, we'll find the crowd's reaction to Peter and the apostles preaching here, and they get the point. They're convicted of crucifying their Messiah, and they cry out, what, what shall we do? And Lord willing, we'll pick that up in our next lesson. We'll start in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2 and, and try to work our way through the end of chapter 2. So I encourage you to study ahead if you can. Read those verses in preparation for uh, that discussion next week. Hope you've uh, enjoyed the study. I would encourage you to continue your own studies on your own time. And you need to stand, spend time in the Word of God because it's our guide. And uh, I would encourage that to the greatest degree. God bless. Have a great week.